We're here to talk about selecting plants and plant combinations in order to create a beautiful border. And I'm with Steve Edney, who many of you will remember from the Growing Dahlias video, which I'll put in the description below. And we're here at his no-name nursery um, that he runs with his partner, Lou Dowell. And he's also head gardener and gardening consultant. I'll put links to plant names and to the no-name nursery and any other resources we mention in the description below and also with timestamps so you can jump to any part of the video you like. If you're new here, The Middle Size Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, then tap the subscribe button. And if you'd like YouTube to tell you when a new video is uploaded, then tap the notifications bell. So Steve, tell me what you're doing here with the No Name Nursery. Me and my partner Louise uh, we were lucky enough to get a piece of land and uh, we wanted to create a garden and a nursery of our own, a place to, to escape and enjoy the world uh, and to create a sustainable nursery and to grow an eclectic mix of plants that, that we adore and love. But we wanted to use them and combine them in beds and borders and in a garden setting so that we could continually assess plants um, while we're also offering them for sale because I always say that you should know what you grow uh, and a lot of nurserymen grow plants and they're wonderful at it, but they aren't necessarily gardeners. Whereas me and Louise, first and foremost, I guess we are gardeners and, and nurserymen as well. And in fact, you must have one of the longest long borders in the country here. So you're growing all your plants in context and you're seeing how they perform with each other. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it's, I guess it's the boy in me that wanted to have the biggest and you know, having a long border that's 100 metres long and six metres deep. And actually, it, it's definitely an, an appeal to Louise as well that the two of us can have uh, a border that we can fit nearly 500 different perennial type uh, of plants into. So it means that the opportunity to create combinations and really big, bold groups is, is so much greater. And we modelled it actually on the proportions of the Wisley long border at RHS Wisley in Surrey because we, we visit there quite a lot and I work on plant trials and as a member of the herbaceous committee at the RHS and we wanted it to be a real centrepiece for our own garden which actually on the on the most part is quite a wild garden and not too perfectly manicured. Uh, it's very important that it has uh, a strong uh, environmental lean and that we're very considerate of wildlife invertebrates, mammals, there'll be water, there's lots of bee fodder, but also places, hiding places and overwintering places for, for animals. And, uh, and we share this piece of land with all of the local wildlife, which is in a wider context all around us, not just within our own, with our own site. Could you just briefly explain about the proportion of the border? I think perhaps people maybe when we're in our own home gardens, we might not be thinking about proportion in our borders. So what, what was that calculation? It can be quite unique to, a, to an individual site, but, but really what you want to be careful is that your borders are not too apologetic. You know, sometimes people are afraid to make a border that is larger than, than they think they can cope with. But actually, if you're planting it correctly and densely enough, uh, it actually keeps most of the weeds at bay uh, and and so what you don't want is a border too, too skinny and too long because then it won't feel right and it definitely will feel uh, very small and insignificant. You don't want it to be too dumpy so you don't want it to be deep but ever so narrow so it has a lot to do with your site, with your garden, where, wherever you are and it doesn't matter whether it's a hundred meters long or two meters long. So. For, for us, when we're thinking about proportions, we think about, does it feel right? Does it look right? It's much more about how a border feels in relation to the rest of your garden and your space. Uh, and for us, having a nice straight linear edge is very satisfying because the border itself is quite chaotic and, and jumbly and, and tightly packed. So to see a nice sharp edge is, is quite important. But also we had a huge hedge behind us which was a, a tree line that's a wonderful windbreak that's very important but being six meters tall if we made the border too small it would be completely out of scale thinking about how you select plants if you think here we are going to the garden center or to the nursery or to the plant fair and uh, thinking i really want to make my border a bit more exciting next year so how would you suggest people start thinking okay so 
The first thing to think about uh, when choosing plants for a site is the site itself. We always work from the soil upwards. So um, I know it's a bit boring and you, you hear it a lot, but um, you have to know your soil. And if you know your soil, what kind of soil you have, whether it's sandy or silty or very clay, does it have standing water in the winter? Does it get perishingly dry in the summer? Those are important considerations before you make a plant choice. Once you understand your soil and your local climate, so for us, we're here in East Kent, so we have some of the highest sunshine hours anywhere in the country. We have some of the lowest rainfall anywhere in the country. So uh, plant choices are dictated quite a lot by our climate. And, uh, and so for instance, this, this wonderful Eryngium here, which, which is Yucca folium, chosen because of its drought tolerance, but also uh, because it's incredibly architectural, not just with these, the, these wonderful seed heads. I mean, they're, they're magic while they're in flower, they're magic once they turn into seed heads, but also while the plant is building. Uh, it's almost semi-evergreen, so Yucca folium, as in it's a yucca-like, like the, uh, the succulent plants, so it has a really good rosette, uh, a really good crown of foliage as it's emerging in the spring. So all through the season, uh, the interest is there and it, and it builds slowly until it reaches the final point when it produces a wonderful seed head uh, and, and surprisingly drought tolerant and actually surprisingly stable for such a tall perennial, which is at about, uh, it's about 1.5 meters. So it's quite a, a large stately perennial, but don't let that put you off if you've got a smaller garden because the flower might be at 1.5 meters but the foliage is only at about 80 centimeters or, or 90 centimeters uh, so uh, light can still filter through if you have other plants around it uh, like you have here at the front you have a potentilla this is miss wilmot uh, i love the the opposition between what is effectively such a such a tasteful wonderful sort of creamy um, yellow flower from the uh, uh, eryngium with that quite gaudy uh, hot pink from the potentilla and this has been in flower for months. Our front edges are very important to us to have really long flowering uh, plants and, uh, and the potentilla also has uh, a very different um, uh, leaf shape so that uh, the texture between the different leaf types uh, is really pronounced in the spring as the plants are, are developing and growing so that there's there's real drama between the plants even when they're out of flower uh, and then rising above it to the back with the wonderful steeper giganteum uh, Klein Fontaine which is a, a relatively new cultivar to us so, so lots of the plants in the long border here actually are, are, are we've picked plants that we don't know very well so we can experiment and try new things uh, and so this little combination is one of them that's working really well. And, and then just down to the, to the right hand side here is a Hylotelephium or what people knew as sedum. This one is called Matrona. Now this is a tried and tested. We've grown this a lot uh, in many projects uh, and many planting combinations, which we think is wonderful. It is a bee magnet. Uh, and as um, uh, you know, the bees, they pour all over this plant and in fact you even sometimes find them either drunk or sleeping in it i'm not quite sure which one it is but they're but they're all over it and and they're face down uh like a like a a, a man had too much at the at the bar and um and so they just go absolutely mad for that there's a geranium knitting in as well very nicely called dillis between the eryngium and uh and the steeper now we don't like to have any bare earth Nature doesn't like bare earth. It will always colonize the ground with weeds. Uh, plants that, and that's a, a modern construct, isn't it? The word weed, uh, this idea that it's a plant that we don't want. And so we call it a weed. Could be a, a wonderful perennial, like Verbena bonariensis, for instance, um, often is a bit weedy for us because it seeds around in places we don't want it. So we dig it up where we don't want it. And, and many gardeners refer to that as editing. So you take it out where you don't want it. And it's the same with the combinations here. Um, you know, if, if something's got a bit too big for its boots or there's a bit too much of it, we might snip a little bit out or we might encourage and train it to knit in with the group of plants next to it. The, the thing that always um, you always have to be on the watch for is that one plant doesn't get too big for its boots 
and starts to crowd its neighbor and then and eventually that leads to a plant death because one plant has got a bit too over ambitious and has crowded its neighbor and that that neighbor has died so and we don't always get it right but here i think we've really got it we've got it spot on uh, there's even a little punctuating um veronicastrum here at the front roseum which is uh it's just a nice vertical punch so when we're thinking about to combine them we're thinking about their flowering seasons we're thinking about their attraction to wildlife we're thinking about seed heads we're thinking about their flowering length of flowering period so verbena bampton here at the front wonderful purple foliage wonderful purple flowers an incredibly long flowering period so it's right down on the front here but all in the latter part of the summer so in the spring it's quite slow to get going but actually we don't mind that at all because we want high and late summer interest from this border and uh, and and these provide it in abundance and they're all working together without trying to control each other and would you say when planting with something like sedum which is quite low and flat that to make sure you've got enough upright around it looking at this grouping it sort of yeah. seems that there's quite a deliberate aim to make sure that about half of that is upright so you're quite you're quite right we like to think of any of our beds and borders as like a really slow fireworks display so you've just got plants which punch up through other plants and they explode into flower and then they might go over into seed heads if we don't like the seed head we might cut it out to keep the border looking fresh if we think the seed head is attractive we we leave it and allow it to be part of the combination later on but what you don't want and what people often find is that their borders they've picked plants that are all the same height so there's no drama within the border everyone is obsessed with flowers if you talk to any really good gardener flowers are not quite the afterthought but they're not the primary consideration you're thinking about um, the height of a plant you're thinking about its foliage you're thinking about the other three seasons of interest that that plant might provide for you other than its season of flowering color doesn't just mean flower it color comes from every aspect of the plant but we we hone in as gardeners on flowers because often that's the moment as well when insects butterflies moths bees it, even sometimes flies i know none of us like flies particularly but they're also very important to biodiversity and uh, and and we tend to focus in just at that flowering moment because there's often a, a real hum of activity around a plant uh, but it shouldn't be your primary consideration alone uh, and the grasses of course add real drama because of their uh, because of the movement so so don't be afraid to plant grasses that are significantly larger perhaps uh, than some of your other plants around it proportionally wise you wouldn't want anything to be a third bigger than the plant next to it maybe 50 percent um, unless unless you've made a conscious choice to do that um, but grasses don't be afraid to use very tall grasses because often their foliage is very low and it's their seed heads which are incredibly high and they're often so light and whimsical that they their movement is incredibly important in a border and you see straight through them as well so it's not like it has a blocking effect so you can effectively use grasses almost anywhere in a border when it comes to grasses i would say again this rule of three never use more than a third of grass in your in your borders otherwise suddenly in the summer you'll feel it's perhaps a little flat and you'll think oh why isn't there enough flower you know i was i was hoping for a bit more going on the grasses are wonderful but i'd like a, a bit more flower and interest uh, from from the color plants all by themselves in a monoculture never really appeals to me even dahlias i know i love a dahlia but i'd much see them combined in beds and borders it's the same with roses so when we were first designing our border we thought about where the roses and where the shrubs and where the evergreen perennials were all going first before the rest of the planting was stitched in around those groups <laughs> So this Persicaria Indian Summer is a plant that we can't agree on. The problem I have is not the plant itself. You know I adore the plant. We, we saw it together in the Netherlands in a wonderful garden, Bob Foltz, 
and it was, its setting I felt was right in an exotic planting scheme. I just don't think it's right here in our in our perennial long border. I think it would be better over in our jungle garden. I think it works here because of the colouring of the leaf, especially it gives us some added autumn colour to this space. Um, the bees love it. And, uh, you know, we have got room to have it over in the jungle as well as in this border. I mean, you know, it's quite big enough, this border, to take the odd thing that we don't agree on. Well, uh, that's true. And I, and I guess ultimately, when you're trying to resolve, if you're both very keen gardeners and, you know, you have plants that you love and plants that you don't and you are individuals so that's going to be different for each of you you know i know there are plants up and down this border that i love that you don't and and it's the same the other way around i just don't think it's really working and you do i think for me also but it's the color of the flower it's just we we went for a and and we were quite vigorous with each other about the colour limitation of the colour palette within this border. And you've, um, you've thrown caution to the wind there, I think. It's a bit too red for this border. Says the man that wants to put yellow and white in here. <laughs> uh, oh, don't forget the orange. I want, I want, I want a bit of orange in here too. too. I, I think at the moment, it doesn't look too bad. Do you know, it's earlier in the season that I dislike it intensely because it's, it's form. And it's, and it's growing habit as it's developing earlier in the summer, as I walk past, it offends me continuously. If the leaves were really gr just green, it'd be going. But because of the purple in leaves, it softens the flower colour down. It doesn't stand out so much. I, I can't disagree because I do, I think it's a wonderful plant and I'm certainly not berating the plant. And do you know what the... the there isn't such a thing as a bad plant. There, there is just bad gardeners that perhaps aren't using plants in the right ways. Sometimes all the elements are correct and it, you're just not getting it right, putting them together. And, and this, is where, this is where our creativity kicks in and, and we just bounce off each other. Sometimes that is in almost violent argument <laughs> <laughs> and be, people are just kind of, oh, oh well, no. But some, you know, uh, I think all of the, the best things come out of a creative melting pot which is what the two of us are together we i mean i'll continue to challenge you over that plant and i know you will do the same with other plants around the border anything else you can add to convince me <laughs> to keep that to want to keep that plant there hmm. maybe oh i think it's i think it's going it's coming out no it's not <laughs> I think it needs something uh, different around it. it. It'll make it look different with a different combination around it. Do you think maybe it's because we've got a few other plants which are all a similar height around yeah, it? Yeah, it and, needs some more drama with it. And so actually maybe this is partly our own fault for making other plant choices around it that we could make better choices. But the Venonia has only just gone in this year, so it's not going to reach its, its height potential until this year season. three yeah because it's year one and and it will be th most perennials don't reach their peak flowering performance and, and growth until year three so we're expecting it to be about a third taller in yeah. a couple of years time that that'll help yeah and the grass was moved again this year yeah yeah and and we we did drop in these wonderful annual ricinus new zealand purple uh, which actually are doing a wonderful job of completely masking the plant so I don't have to look <laughs> at it. <laughs> if you'd like to know more about creating beautiful borders, check out our Beautiful Borders playlist at the end of this video. And let me know if you have any particularly favourite perennial plant combinations in the comments. And thank you for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>